California. Thanks for joining our webinar today on uh, auditors and managers. What do you really need to know about environmental liabilities? We'll be starting in just a few minutes. I uh, just wanted to draw your attention in the meantime to the go to webinar control panel. Uh, in, in that control panel, there is space for questions and for chat. I'll be monitoring that on a separate screen on my webinar presentation here for the next hour. If you've got questions or uh, ideas or uh, actually most sincerely, if you've got some technical issues on your side about uh, audio quality, uh, feel free to drop me a note. Uh, actually, feel free to drop me a note right now as either a question or chat to just to let me know the audio is okay. And uh, with that, we'll just get started in the next uh, moment or two. Thank you again for joining our webinar. We look forward to uh, hearing your questions today. Thanks. Again, uh, good morning, everyone. John Rosengard with Environmental Risk Communications in Oakland, California. Thanks for joining our webinar today on uh, auditors and managers. What do you really need to know about environmental liabilities? Uh, what I'll be doing is uh, covering a series of slides here today, getting into a little bit of detail about the business risks that go with looking at environmental risks. Uh, with that in mind, I just want to draw your attention to the Go to Webinar control panel. There's two sections in here, one for chat, one for questions. Uh, let me try and use the chat uh, feature here for a, section, for a second. I just wanted to uh, let you know that if you have questions throughout the presentation or if you have, um, if you have audio difficulties or if you just have a point of clarification, feel free to uh, drop me a note using either one of these features of the GoToWebinar control panel. Just drop me a quick note and I'll do my best to answer the questions as we go forward here. Um, this format is just uh, going to be a very straightforward one. Uh, let me get into the, uh, uh, the outline for today. Uh, first of all, I'll be covering my bio um, a little bit so you've got a frame of reference of, uh, of my experience and where my uh, uh, points of information today are coming from. Then I'll be covering uh, what are the, uh, the, the touchstone points of, uh, of instruction for us to use in managing environmental risks and, and documenting them. And that's uh, the generally accepted accounting principle. So I'll, I'll just refer or refresh on what those, uh, those key points of information are and handle any questions I can on those. Finally, I'll get into the heart of the presentation, which are the points for auditors and managers. And we spend a little bit more time uh, on how the two uh, interact with one another. And uh, in turn, uh, point over to the last point, which are the risks to watch for, the risks to be aware for. Uh, time permitting, I'll get into a little bit more, more detail about what are the specific components of, uh, uh, of generally accepted accounting principles that instruct how managers respond to business risk. And I hope this is uh, uh, insightful and you learn things uh, perhaps that uh, you've never seen drawn together before and this is uh, instructive, uh, instructive content for you. With that, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, just ask if you can uh, 
uh, bear with me while I give you a little bit of, of uh, background about what we talk about uh, when we talk about environmental liability. Uh, we talk about environmental liabilities as sort of those uh, uh, sometimes off balance sheet, sometimes on balance sheet uh, uh, items, and they uh, they really do uh, they really do sometimes uh, come up as, as significantly large numbers. And I, I say that because in the last 20 years, the general accepted accounting principles around environmental risk has evolved significantly. Uh, when I started my company in 1994. General accepted accounting principles were a series of references to something written 20 years earlier, 1975. There were n there was not a lot of data at the time, not a lot of uh, points about general accepted accounting principles covering environmental risk. Since then, um, there there have been several waves prompted uh, initially by uh, a clarification called SOP 961 that came out in 1996, and then Sarbanes Oxley, and then uh, FASB 143, and uh, then FASB 157 now Dodd-Frank, and now uh, some, some additional points around climate change. So the evolution really has, has, has meant that numbers suddenly kind of come up as long-term large numbers, but don't seem to be short-term high-budget numbers. Uh, so sometimes you hear this, you see this kind of detachment that I see in this, this uh, New Yorker cartoon, oh, that's $3 billion, emphasizing that, some, that some, sometimes there's just a combination of big numbers, but a short-term detachment from where those are going to be paid for and how that work is going to be executed. So let me give you a little bit of a background on my frame of reference. Uh, I started my company, Environmental Risk Communications, uh, 20 years ago here in Oakland, California. I'm the founder and CEO of an author, author, and author of a software tool called Defender, which helps companies document their environmental liability. So if there's anything uh, in the short version that I've been doing for the last 20 years, it's developing the software and helping deploy it to help companies document their environmental, uh, environmental liabilities. With that, we've helped uh, 14 corporate user teams uh, document their full liability portfolios of environmental risks. Roughly about 60 CPA audits as part of that. That covers uh, just around 3,000 sites and 200 deep dive uh, decision analysis projects. It's what we know and what we love. So we're a, by necessity a small firm, uh, but we respond to a, a with depth and, and uh, I think some pretty useful, interesting experience now that we've, uh, we've gone through some critical mass here. Uh, we've also been on the public sector side, public agency side, supporting companies that comply with uh, GASB 49, which is a different part of GAAP covering, uh, covering public agencies like state, federal, county, municipal governments, uh, port authorities, airports, and so on. We've helped four of those survive roughly 10 plus audits, and uh, we've also developed a counterparty credit tracking system for looking at uh, um, the environmental risk of different uh, circle of PRPs over the very, very long term, like five or ten years. And we've been doing this with this scope of work for about uh, about 12 years already. Uh, my frame of reference is I have a, a two business degrees, one from Northwestern, I've got an MBA, and a bachelor's undergraduate from uh, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. So I have two business degrees as my frame of reference plus my experience running this company uh, uh, here in California. So my, my frame is not as an environmental consultant or as an attorney, an engineer, uh, chemical, environmental, or, or otherwise, or as a CPA. My experiences in developing the software and applying it to help companies uh, work through their environmental liabilities, document them, and complete an audit successfully. So with that, let me give you uh, two slides about what are the, the, the correct gap references today. Um, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll go over some of the legacy references that are associated with that. The number one and number two environmental risk uh, components of gap are uh, ASC, 410-20, which covers asset retirement obligations, and ASC 410-30, which covers environmental obligations. Really isn't any substitute for reading those. Those are the great foundational, fundamental documents that describe how environmental and asset retirement obligations are supposed to be calculated, stored, uh, uh, described, and, and disclosed, and displayed to shareholders, and so on. So it is really the, the fundamental uh, document pairing. It's available for free 24 hours a day from the FASB.org website. There really isn't a substitute for just sitting down and reading through these. They're about uh, uh, 35 to 40 pages uh, when, when combined all into one document. And they do bring up uh, unique, unique concepts, uh, but all of these concepts have legacy references. Uh, when the ASC process of putting restating all of this started about three or four years ago, um, I thought there would be a great great uh, groundswell of rewriting uh, 
environmental reserve policies at Fortune 500 companies in the U.S., which is our core customer base. I still have yet to see that. I still see lots of references to the old legacy documents, which are things like FASB 143. FASB Statement 143 covers asset retirement obligations, as does FIN 47, which covers conditional asset retirement obligations. Those are portions of GAAP that are now folded into AFC 410-20. So it's uh, uh, important to keep in mind that as I go over these GAAP sources, you may find out that you, your company, or your client, uh, if you're an environmental service provider, uh, doesn't have current GAAP references. So my, my point for bringing this up is that current GAAP references, even if they're just four years old now, using current GAAP references is absolutely critical. The legacy references are no longer there are also other components that we find time and again are relevant to looking at environmental uh, environmental risks, and they get beyond what's in ASC 410, and they get into uh, these other components that I'll describe in, in a little bit of detail about how they do affect how environmental risks get quantified. Uh, first of all, ASC 410, I'm sorry, ASC 440 covers commitments. That is promises made out, promises uh, to perform work, not necessarily in a contractual sense, but it, uh, it can be a contractual commitment. But it's basically the, the, uh, the process, the, the components of GAAP that describe how commitments are booked, when they're recognized, when they're placed on the balance sheet, and what methods are used for monetizing them. That is the converting them to, uh, uh, instead of a, a written promise, into a, a financial statement component that has a dollar value attached to it. So ASC 440 covers commitments. ASC 450 is contingencies. Now, contingencies it contains the language about uh, whether a liability is probable and reasonably estimable. And that's uh, uh, where that language still resides today. ASC 450 uh, covers contingencies. But it's focused more toward, uh, toward legal claims, toward claims on a company's assets that are just resolved really with monetary negotiations, uh, litigation, and so on. It does not address specifically uh, asset retirement and environmental obligations as ASC 410 does. So the blurry lines that we see in looking at GAAP is there's a lot of, uh, a lot of legacy orientation of looking at environmental liabilities as contingencies and not as ASC 410 environmental obligations. So what, is, what am I trying to get at here? If you talk about environmental risk as the big comprehensive big circle in the Venn diagram, the non-overlapping circles are obligations, commitments, contingencies, and guarantees. Those are all four different types of environmental risks. They don't overlap with each other, but they do touch. Uh, so as a consequence, I, I, and again, encourage you, if you work with environmental risk, get comfortable with these four different terms. What's an obligation? What's a commitment? What's a contingency? And what's a guarantee? Uh, because each of those components go back into what a, a, a internal management needs to work with and budget for, what uh, needs to be displayed and disclosed to management, and uh, in turn to uh, the stakeholders from there. The next part is ASC 460 covering guarantees. And this is more or less like it sounds if there's a, a, a guarantee in writing that one party, uh, like an organization or a Fortune 500 company selling off a plant, and they make a guarantee that they will ensure that uh, uh, environmental compliance work will get done or that the condition of the, uh, the site is X. Monetizing that guarantee is tricky. Monetizing that guarantee takes time and effort. It is also, I promise you, a little bit of a thankless job because it really does involve um, uh, documenting uh, an acquisition or divestiture well after the fact and well after the values have generally been assigned. It's a challenge of communications more than anything else. But again, ASC 460 contains the definitive U.S. generally accepted accounting principles about how to document, book, display, and disclose guarantees. Finally, uh, one overriding part about how to look at environmental risks is contained in ASC 820, which covers fair value measurement. Fair value measurement uh, hit pretty strongly back in 2000 and it led to a lot of changes in how banks valued assets and liabilities. Uh, you, you probably saw in the recession there was a lot of discussion about how collateralized debt obligations like mortgage obligations were treated and valued in, a, in the financial downturn. ASC 820 was a pivotal part of that and its predecessor document FASB 157 
uh, definitely was a part about how to value those assets. However, big point, ASC 820 doesn't just cover assets. ASC 420 fair value measurement also covers liabilities. There's specific sections. It points directly to value your environmental liabilities. Will the other parties be able to pay their share? What will you be able to settle this liability if you had to today in the absence of, of good information, let alone perfect information? So ASC 820 is one of those components of GAAP that touches everything, whether there's an environmental obligation or a commitment or a contingency or a guarantee. I just want to say that these, these sections here that I've got laid out, these, uh, these uh, five or six, these really do make up the core that I'd recommend you read sometime. It does take a, a specialist knowledge for some terminology, but it really is a, a useful set of documents. And they've all been compiled now into a single fluid uh, document set. That's been the accounting standards codification, is putting them all together on the web in one fluid, uh, one fluid set of, of uh, chapters and subchapters instead of a disparate set of documents that have to be cross-referenced and interpreted. So very useful to read those. Next is uh, a series of other references that I've found over time have been incredibly useful for evaluating environmental uh, environmental risks. I won't read these uh, these items off to you uh, one by one unless you really insist. But I found that through trial and error, knowing what each of these looks like consists of how they really do uh, function in an organization it goes back to what a company has for its own internal policy, what it's what's part of its own culture how it really does expect to resolve its environmental liabilities uh, over the uh, coming years. So again, the different standard setting organizations range from the Securities and Exchange Commission to the Government Accounting Standards Board uh, to the uh, International Accounting Standards Board, the uh, American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM, as well as the U.S. Uh, Congress passing Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank uh, in the last uh, 12 years. And at the newest entrant is the Public Companies Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB, which was created out of the Dodd-Frank Act. So it's, it's all new in the last four or five years. But the rules that they're coming up with are, are, are tremendously strong in giving, giving auditors new powers. So if there's anything I'm going to get into today is that auditors and uh, managers are really working in a, in a brand new world, different than the world that they worked in uh, even five years ago. So. A quick differentiation between auditors and managers. Auditors add value by confirming if mixed statements occur. And I'm not referring to, to environmental auditors, but the financial auditors, how financial auditors really do, do function in. Uh, but it is not all that wholly undifferent from what an environmental auditor or an environmental assessor will do out there in the field. Uh, an auditor is really there to make sure on the next bullet point to determine if any misstatements are material, to really see if there's any material missing information or if there are misstatements that can be misinterpreted or, uh, or uh, just can be characterized as uh, materially incorrect. Next, it's important that an auditor test, uh, it's, it's essential duty rather, that uh, an auditor test uh, the design and operating effectiveness of internal controls. Make sure that there are checks and balances in place that survive any one person's interpretation, any one person's activities, that there are ways of ensuring that a company's or an organization's way of documenting its compliance with environmental laws and regs and in turn booking the uh, compliance costs associated with those environmental costs and risks uh, is done consistently, it's done clearly and as transparently as the organization feels necessary. And finally, uh, another way that auditors add value is to confirm that similar liabilities are documented in similar ways. That's one of the great things that an auditor does to ensure the health of the organization is ensure there's consistent rigor in thinking. And if you can imagine any organization that goes through a merger, there's there's initially two ways of doing things. Auditors help ensure that there is going to be, over the long term, one way of doing things. There won't be blind spots and data gaps. Uh, in the bottom half of the slide, I just want to point out a couple ways that corporate managers add value. First of all, by ensuring that the company is in compliance, by having the right people, policies, procedures in place, ensuring that the staff in turn has the right training to handle those, uh, uh, those obligations as well as the tools and procedures that they've been given. Uh, so tr uh, staff training and staff orientation uh, is, again, another responsibility of management to ensure that there is uh, adequate oversight and adequate resources. And finally, corporate managers, in turn, add value by ensuring that the values of the organization um, is expressed through the budgets and through the capital plan, through how the resources get allocated. 
So the things that the managers can do in turn but auditors can't do when looking at environmental risks is uh, a manager can order a phase two assessment, a detailed assessment of a site. An auditor can't, can't ask for additional holes to be drilled. They can only say that there's a material lack of data and uh, more wells, more soil samples will solve that. But a manager can do that, but an auditor can't physically do that. Uh, managers, in turn, can determine the pace to closure uh, uh, for a site or a portfolio. Will liabilities be worked down, for example, in five years versus 20 years or longer? Uh, so uh, determining the pace to closure, which is a, a maybe a 15-year-old term from the US Department of Energy about when done will be done and what done will look like, uh, the pace to closure is one of those themes that one of those tones at the top that comes from senior management it does not come from uh, from auditors. Finally, uh, or next rather to uh, select a remedial technology for a specific site or decide if an employee acted improperly or uh, or did act inbounds with the, uh, the existing company policies and procedures. Uh, next, managers ensure that uh, there's enough data to split up environmental compliance costs into the buckets that they belong in. And this is capitalism 101. They're just different types of money in it. So using operating expenses, capital expenditures, asset retirement obligations, and reserve dollars, they all have different financial impacts, tax consequences. They need different levels of rigor. And in turn, setting the right tone, setting the right balance, setting the right spending levels, those are things managers can do, auditors can't do. Just a natural division of uh, responsibilities and labor. Auditors evaluate uh, the split of the costs, but they don't uh, have the authority, of course, to set them. And then the managers finally are responsible and are the duty holder for determining if this year's budget is good. So with that, let's get into the heart of the presentation here today that I really wanted to cover with you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the one thing that I've learned time and again is that reserve policies that I see today, and that is spending on environmental risk, to spend down and work down environmental risks, are really still heavily tilted toward ASC 450, not ASC 820. So what is that? boil down to. ASC 450 treats environmental obligations, again going back, do you remember the parts of GAAP, treats environmental obligations like contingencies, which means until we recognize and book an environmental risk and the solution to that environmental risk, we're going to test for is the liability, is it, is it probable that a loss has occurred and is a, a loss reasonably estimable, those two tests. Okay. That puts you in ASC 450, right? treating an environmental obligation like a contingency. If you just go back to ASC 410 all by itself, it references having a fair value, having a, a good estimate that's based on a weighted range of scenarios. That in turn references ASC 820, which is fair value measurement, which means if you had to settle the liability today with what little or as much as you know today, if you had to settle that with an equally competent uh, third party in an orderly transaction, with an arm's length transaction, what would that value be? And that may tell you something very, very different. For example, if you've got a, a service station and you've got one underground storage tank and it is 75 years old, uh, you may step back and say, you know, we haven't been given a notice of violation. We haven't, uh, uh, we haven't heard of any problems at the water well a half a mile away. We don't have any data that there's a problem yet. Okay, that's one thing that an ASC 450 would tell you that the environmental liability today on the books is zero. ASC 450 says one thing. Okay, what does ASC 820 say? If you went to a competent buyer who wanted to buy that service station property from you, and you told them, okay, we have a 75-year-old service station. We don't have any monitoring wells. We don't have any soil samples. We haven't pulled up the concrete or the asphalt on top of it. We haven't done any water samples off-site or at the property boundary, and we haven't dug up the tank yet. A cognizant, wise buyer would say, okay, I'm going to factor in a whole series of contingencies on my own, risks on my own. I'm going to price them, and I'm going to buy your property, but I'm also going to discount for the fair value measurement of those based on my perceptions of what similar sites cost to do similar scopes of activities. So a wise buyer would step back and say, it'll cost me probably 50 k to do the right level of study, and then I'll have some unknowns. There might be no problem, or there might be a range of 100 k to $2 million, who knows, 100 k to $2 million worth of excavation, remediation, and so on. I'm going to do a probabilistic estimate. I'm going to do a decision tree. I'm going to do something to create a number that says, 
the range of cost outcomes is probably going to be 200K to 2.1 million, probably weighted toward the longer the range because of the age of the tank and other data that we're able to gather without doing field work. In turn, that fair value measurement is the proper market value that belongs in the books today. So the point that I've got here today is reserve policies and thinking is still geared toward, have we got a notice of violation? No? Great, let's move on. Have we got an off-site receptor that's complaining? No, great, let's move on. Have we got data that says the sediments are dirty? No, great, move on. That's not the same as saying, are the sediments clean? Prove it. You have proof? Great, leave the value at zero. ASC 820 gives a bias toward confirmation, compliance assurance, organizational excellence. And that is a different mindset that is part of ASC 410. Looking at environmental risks generally, generally as obligations, not as commitments, contingencies, or guarantees, but instead of looking at them as obligations. So that's a big part of looking at a reserve policy is do environmental risks get called and treated like environmental obligations? Uh, next, uh, auditors have astonishing powers. And I ask you to look at your calendar today with all due sincerity and say this is 2014. Auditors are generally not using the powers they have. Uh, auditors have a broad reaching set of powers to evaluate the expertise of, uh, of, of cost assessors, of environmental assessors, of environmental auditors. Uh, financial auditors have the powers to overwrite, scrape away, and redo any environmental risk forecast for asset retirement obligations, environmental mitigation reserves, they have the power to wipe those estimates away and replace them with their own. They have those powers today. They were given those powers under Dodd-Frank in 2010. It's all relatively new. I haven't seen amazing exercises and use of those powers yet, but I just want to point out today's 2014. Uh, a lot of, of uh, SEC regulatory and enforcement time and talent has gone to the financial services industry in the last five years. I think that's now pivoting. I think that's now turning toward uh, the other issues that have not uh, gotten SEC and Department of Justice regulatory attention. So I just want to point out that at some point, I mean, I'm, I'm betting my, my time and career on this, uh, this expectation here, but I think auditors will have uh, the latitude and, and more experience in using those powers in the near future. I really do think auditors will find and, and use those powers to explore more deeply into the undocumented, uncharacterized, and open-ended, compartmentalized environmental risk and risks that companies have absorbed, and look for more confirmation that the data truly is zero as opposed to it's presumed zero until proved otherwise. So again, auditors have remarkable powers to fix that if they want to use them. The next two points I've got, duty holders have a continuous exposure to state and, and uh, clarify and update uh, their knowledge about where environmental Stand. And then the last bullet point I've got, I think is intuitive to everybody who's worked in our field for a little while. Environmental liabilities are inherently complex. They're negative net present value activities for one. Uh, that's an important thing to remember is generally these are, are thankless activities that have negative NPV. There's, there's a, a clear amount of cost. There's a vague value of benefit. So the cost-benefit ratio is often squishy and often bad, which are two things that don't uh, generally draw welcoming warm attention to, uh, to, uh, to them. So I just wanted to again say the complexity is, is coming from a lot of different directions. The allocation of what, what share of a liability is assumed by an organization is often subject to negotiation and litigation. Um, remedy selection, often subject to data, rigorous data collection and in turn the availability and cost effectiveness uh, and certainly the scientific effectiveness of, uh, of different technologies. Contaminant fee transport is one of those unknown fields. We don't know how the 80,000 chemical compounds that are known out there that have MSDSs that are marketed and sold today, we don't know how they all interact with each other. We just do not know. We know how some of them that are, that are more commonly seen react with some other ones, but we don't know how all of them interact with bedrock and clay and sand and soil, uh, silty soil. And I say that as the guy with two business degrees. So if the guy with two business degrees knows this, I'm sure you, those of you that have scientific backgrounds, know and live this every day. Uh, this, uh, the next point is, is that there are other cost recoveries in place aside from uh, just insurance or for those uh, defense department and utility companies, uh, rate recovery uh, through, through overhead allocation and so on. 
so there are other cost recovery activities like uh, uh, insurance uh, that may re reduce the net cost uh, of complying with a project. I don't always, I'll step back here for a second, I never see that an environmental project team knows if their company and their team is working with 10 cent dollars, uh, meaning they're getting 90 percent reimbursement, or they're working with 50 cent reimbursement and 50 cent dollars, or they're working with 100 cent dollars. The presumption that I've seen with project teams is that they're always working with 100 cent dollars. That's not always true. In fact, I find that it's rarely true. Uh, first of all, since most environmental remediation spending is tax deductible, the, the pre-tax impact is always uh, uh, different from the after-tax impact because, again, the, the compliance spending is going to be deducted from the taxable income of the company. So, again, it's important to know what sort of uh, net after-tax impact there is of complying with uh, environmental laws and regs and reducing environmental risks. Often the cost of compliance is much different higher and lower, much different than the original perception, and that in turn can drive better decision making in my experience. Next, uh, one point that we see as a blind spot for organizations that we try to work with and that we do work with and we try to get the word out is the counterparty risk of default, that is the probability that another PRP will bail on their environmental obligations and strand them and they will somehow default back to your organization slowly over a series of years. That, that risk of default is astronomical through the roof. It's growing every day and in recessions it goes into overdrive. Uh, so counterparty risk of default is one aspect that's actually mandatory to, com to calculate today. It's been mandatory for 20 years uh, and we're still finding that uh, on our side we have, we have an education uh, mission to achieve to tell uh, uh, people looking at environmental obligations that assessing the credit quality of a counterparty, that is someone who's going to be sharing your costs uh, it's an important activity to evaluate and, and find out at which sites that issue is material. Uh, in turn, uh, moving on to the next bullet point, cost increases are an inevitable part of what we do. Costs for environmental, uh, resolving environmental risks tend to increase at a rate that's different than the classic standard consumer price index. Uh, we find that it uh, increases at something called the producer price index, uh, which is around a half a percent higher percent different than the standard inflation rate. So we find that, uh, again, uh, looking at long-term cost forecasts can be challenging if uh, it's using a consumer price index as an inflation guide instead of a producer price index. So a fine point on that if there's any questions or interest on that topic. Uh, I've been doing this for a while and I'd be glad to share my experience. Uh, moving on to the last uh, uh, couple points here, there is a data collection bias. Uh, and the bias goes actually the other way toward not collecting defamatory, negative, or uncomfortable data. That's just a, an institutional bias that every institution on planet Earth has got, is that collecting uncomfortable information uh, is, uh, is, is not an intuitive, natural act. So in turn, there's a bias against uh, being the messenger bearing bad news, collecting uh, bad information for the purpose of collecting it. Uh, it that in turn means that looking at environmental liability with less than solid information, let alone less than perfect information, is to be tricky. Finally, the number, nature, quantities of contaminants, uh, the lack of data around that, uh, the lack of, of uh, science about how the number, nature, and quantities interact with one another, in turn leads us to a, a continuous battle to, to try and solve issues uh, while we're looking at uh, redefining what, what done is going to look like and what the problem actually is today. So with that, let's move forward to our, our next uh, content around uh, uh, evaluating the business risks. And uh, this is just a grocery list of what we see at ERCI about what to anticipate. First and foremost uh, is that there is going to be a lag between a legislative or regulatory change and marking that liability to market. And that's, that's just going to be an inevitable part of how, how businesses work. Legislation, regulations will change, then the market will respond uh, both on the provider side of what environmental services providers will do, but also on the liability holder side, the obligation holder side, what they will do to respond to that. Uh, but that lag is going to be normal, but it's also uh, going to be worth revisiting on a consistent basis because the number and pace of legislative and regulatory change has only accelerated in the last 20 years. Uh, for those of you that, have, that are relatively new to your career, you may believe that just the, the number of 
regulatory obligations uh, sort of always been there. But in stepping back through my, my uh, almost 30 years of working in, in industry, we originally started with just a few acts, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act in the 70s. And the escalation, the quantity of laws that have changed and, and been introduced, as well as the overlapping jurisdictions of those, as well as the overlapping uh, requirements of the, re the regulations to implement those laws, that has gone up astronomically, uh, geometrically, uh, over the last 30 years. And it just has, as again, more information is gleaned and there are more laws to work with, there are just more obligations. Another thing that we've seen is that there are fewer people uh, supporting more uh, compliance obligations. That's another trend that we've also seen in looking at uh, uh, managing environmental risk is that there are more uh, there are more things to do, but there are few people to help get them done. The next uh, uh, business risk that we see is really important to anticipate is that uh, environmental risks from acquisitions are going beyond scope, and it's primarily due to a lack of data. Uh, the data that's known at the moment of acquisition is uh, uh, is often quite different from the data that is collected and used over the ensuing years. So acquisitions tend to be a sore spot for uh, looking at an environmental risk portfolio growing exponentially because companies that do things to get acquired, like you know, get their balance sheet in shape, look attractive financially, look profitable, uh, to appear profitable. Uh, those sometimes mean that environmental risks are treated in a fashion that uh, they would not be treated by the acquirer. And so the imputed cost of bringing uh, acquired operations into compliance is, uh, is often a significant one. And lack of data is just a, a significant connection point or, or loss, of, uh, loss of opportunity for bringing uh, buyers and sellers together with a zero, in a zero surprises environment. The third point, uh, sellers are committing, uh, committing some acts which you could possibly describe as criminal, negligence, malfeasance, intentionally losing institutional knowledge, doing things like deliberately understaffing or deliberately having turnover uh, in, in knowledge sensitive areas uh, regarding environmental risks. These are things that, that do happen. Uh, I don't think there's any one big comprehensive conspiracy going on, but these are some of the incidental acts that we see just in the course of business getting done is that we see that, that uh, there's, there's not a comprehensive awareness of every law and reg around uh, environmental risks. There's not an awareness of gap around uh, every environmental risk. There's not a lot of documentation around every perspective of environmental risk. I understand it, and I think we should all expect it. However, in the fullness of time, we can all look back and probably say that there were some business aspects, some business risks that were blind spots. And some of those blind spots are being created intentionally or just being created accidentally. Uh, one of the ways that we see that there's intention, to move on to the next two bullet points, is where we see deliberate understaffing and turnover, that is deliberate short, uh, shorting of resources in order to process environmental risks. That's a way of keeping spending down is by deliberately understaffing uh, the compliance activities. Uh, and then in turn having uh, record retention policies that deliberately cause continuous loss of institutional knowledge. That is the uh, people and the documentation about waste practices are periodically purged. And therefore, if, uh, if there's a need or a question regarding what's known, the people and the records uh, associated with, uh, with the conditions of the past are just not there. Often this is just an ordinary uh, process of doing business, but we find that having uh, material safety data sheets uh, and having uh, waste disposal manifest records uh, pay off over decades, decades later than waste manifests were actually generated and used. Uh, finally, uh, another business risk that can be anticipated by a, a business manager and by an auditor is that there is going to be unstructured judgment in determining environmental risk. And this unstructured judgment is one of the things that uh, I, ERCI works pretty hard to contain. So one of the, some of the things that we see that we try and watch out for and try to, uh, to help mitigate for is the lack of benchmarked industry data is collecting what a company's own spending is like on hand, handling environmental risks or what peer companies are spending on environmental risks. Data has never been cheaper. Data has never been more freely available. Every EPA record of decision ever written is available for free on the internet today. 20 years ago, that was not true. 30 years ago, that was an imaginary capability. 10 years ago, it was still getting there. It is here today. 
uh, also on the state level, uh, seeing the, uh, the different feasibility studies for what different state-led cleanups or state-controlled uh, state or regulated cleanups uh, cost are often available in some states, where you can see what the cost for different service stations, different record closures, different uh, uh, mine remediation projects, and so on. Uh, that data is generally in uh, the public domain or close to it with a, a Freedom of Information Act request. My point being that having benchmark data available is just really in the hands of uh, uh, environmental service providers, environmental consultants, environmental attorneys today, and it's never been cheaper to get a higher quality uh, data set than it is today. So seeing unstructured judgment by not using that, it sort of gets problematic. The data is, is, has never been easier to find, never been easier to get to, so not using it uh, is a uh, less and less viable excuse going forward. Next bullet point is seeing a lack of rigor, and this is one of the uh, challenges that we see in today's, uh, today's work environment, is that there are a lot of demands on people's time. Having uh, quiet time to, uh, to focus continuously for two to four hours on what is the, uh, the, the potential solution set for an environmental risk, we don't always see that there's a, a capability or an opportunity to apply rigor to, uh, to make good decisions or to, uh, to vet a wide range of doable alternatives. Consequently, a lack of rigor is one of the things that an auditor can look for, and if an auditor and or, and or a business manager looks for that lack of rigor, they'll probably find that it could be better, that there could be a formal decision analysis process, there could be a focus on compliance assurance or organizational excellence. Those are things that we've seen some of our clients apply that really do create step changes in the improvement and the internalization of the environmental risk decision making. And I do want to call out one of my clients. Uh, Chevron, uh, based here in California, they developed a, a, an approach to, to uh, an industry-wide activity called an organizational excellence, and they developed a program uh, called Compliance Assurance to really uh, institutionalize how the company looks at environmental risk. I've never seen anything like it. It's the most rigorous, thorough program I've ever seen. And when I look at uh, what, what done does look like, it really does revolve around having good questions with training tools, procedures, laminated instruction cards, structured agendas, uh, desired outcomes that are known, and managers that, that know how to run through a checklist of questions to ensure that a diligent job has been done. That rigor really can get institutionalized. I've seen it firsthand. And I do assert that if your organization really does want to provide a step change improvement in evaluating environmental risks and get out of hoping you're in compliance or thinking you're in compliance and getting to a place where you know you're in compliance, and you know you have the data to back up and validate that opinion. Uh, compliance assurance really is the, is the pivotal way to go. So with that in mind, I wanted to move forward with a, a grocery list of questions that can be asked at a portfolio level. And I just want to skim through these to give you a sense that there are already plenty of rules in place today. There are already plenty of gap obligations. There are plenty of common sense business risk avoidance steps plenty of common tools and procedures out there, and really it's, it's just a matter of making the time and making, uh, finding the right level of attention, because generally companies find that they're themselves not in acute environmental uh, compliance uh, risk. They're not generally in immediate catastrophic human health and the environment risk. They're in sort of chronic long-term environmental risk, and without a rigorous program, they can find themselves still in chronic environmental risk experiencing chronic environmental risk decades from now and still be spending an inordinate amount of people and time and capital trying to resolve those chronic risks instead of addressing them institutionally at a top level. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, I just want to point out is just this very first question. And this was one of the findings from the Deepwater Horizon study that was done um, uh, just in the aftermath of that, uh, of that tragedy. Uh, so again, the Deepwater Horizon was the catastrophic release of uh, Condo Well 252 in the sorry, Mississippi Canyon Block 252. It was also called the Macondo Well incident or the Deepwater Horizon spill. One of the findings of the, uh, the uh, public agency uh, inspection, I'm sorry, the public agency review that was done, was that project teams and key consultants were not trained in how to manage environmental risk. So they were able to they had state-of-the-art tools, but they were not trained to use those tools competently. 
Uh, therefore, the people that were in the positions to make decisions were unable to make decisions with the data that they had, with the tools they had. They were simply unable to, to, to use A and B together, the, uh, the right data and the right tools together. And the people were the weakness. And training, in turn, was the weakness. The presumption was that everyone's working for a, a great big company, uh, a great company with depths of resources. Any resources that are needed can be brought to bear. There's no shortage of capital. There's no shortage of expertise. That false sense of confidence, in turn, meant that uh, training at that retail level, at that provider level meant that uh, the, well, more or less 5 million gallons of oil was spilled into the Gulf uh, because of those, those failings, that, uh, that sequence of events. If you'd like a copy of that uh, Deepwater Horizon report, I'd be glad to send over my uh, annotated version if you'd like to see it, where I highlight just, uh, just what were the findings of uh, that group. Um, I won't read off these other items here, too, in the, uh, in the uh, I guess, interest of time. But if you do have questions about these, uh, feel free to drop me a note. But I just want to say, if you're interested in seeing this presentation and seeing all of these questions, uh, great. Just drop me a note at uh, john at erci.com. I do want to point off to the far right, uh, the concern or citation that I put off to the far right here is really a gap reference or some experience point that uh, we've had at the ERCI over the last uh, 20 years about looking at uh, environmental risks and stating them as obligations, commitments, contingencies, and guarantees. Uh, so with that, let me move forward here and uh, say that one of the things that we found in looking at environmental risks is, is having a standardized work breakdown structure is one of the easiest things to do. It, it sort of forces a checklist of looking at every environmental risk the same way, and ensuring that, that uh, cost areas don't get skipped over for the sake of looking at uh, uh, that, that pulls too far out. Consistent work breakdown structure, especially when it's dovetailed back to proposals as to how the company's cost accounting system works. Uh, it provides that continuity of, of reporting as knowledge gets accumulated and then in turn uh, gets converted into uh, hopefully liability and risk work down. Uh, with that, uh, there are other questions to ask at the portfolio level that uh, we think are, are pretty, uh, just really essential to get to time and again. And just to go through one or two of these, uh, I just want to point out that that uh, the first one really does come up time and again. Do we do we have an explanation of what the liabilities are or what the obligations are? Do we have a narrative about what it is, what's in scope and out of scope? Lacking that uh, that narrative really becomes one of those those uh, tricky points of saying what what the problem originally was, what the original problem statement was like. So I just wanted to encourage you to uh, to really look at um, a review of of the spending and ensure that there's a statement that goes with the spending that says we're going after putting in five wells. We're going after this soil. We're not able to understand the groundwater and the NERDA claim and the offsite contamination and what's under the foundation of the operating plant. That scope statement is incredibly useful because we find that, that companies generally are, are generous with the resources. Companies and public agencies find themselves able to commit the resources when they understand the scope. The weakness is in the writing that goes with the scope. That's what we found just as a, as a point of what we document. We're not really using our software, our Defender software, so much to document the numbers. That's the, the easier part. The tricky part is documenting the assumptions. How did we get to a 50K cost estimate for that line item? How did we get to $3 million for soil? What are the, the, uh, the variables that go into calculating that soil estimate number? Uh, next uh, bullet point here, I just want, and I'll close out with this on this page. Is there a site-by-site -site breakdown of the liability, which is required under ASC 410-30-15-2 and under GASB 49, which covers public agencies like port authorities and uh, state uh, universities and cities and counties? Uh, GASB 49, paragraph 71 covers this. There's got to be a site-by-site -site breakdown. There can't be a, a, a liability forecast that says, uh, roughly $20 million will handle roughly this aggregated pool of, of uh, properties on this list. There has to be a site-specific estimate. There has to be a site-by-site uh, -site breakdown. There can't be a to-be-determined later cookie jar or, or a, a reserve fund or just a pool. There has to be a site-specific valuation of, uh, of a liability. So the obligations have to be known and documented and understood, and that is that is where the cost estimates are going to come from. 
So again, documentation first, costs second, those are things that we will work on time and time again. I'll leave the rest of these points for reading. If again, you'd like to see the slide set, just uh, be happy to share this. We have these uh, uh, webinars uh, roughly three to five times a month, and we offer them for free as uh, outreach and to, uh, to ensure that uh, there's consistency of practice and do our part for uh, increasing awareness about generally accepted accounting principles. So we're happy to provide this content. We want this content to get out, and we want to answer your questions. So if you do have questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to let me know what you have. Uh, with that, uh, the other questions that uh, we see asked at the portfolio level are just as, as you state them here. But I want to point out the bottom one, because if you're an environmental service provider or you're an environmental manager of a corporation, this one gets missed. It's expensive. And we did help a client with this last year and had particularly useful positive benefits for them. So the last point is, if a site is part of a recent merger or integration, are the costs and strategies updated to reflect the acquirer's policies and procedures? What that means is if company A buys company B, company B's numbers for their sites need to be, need to be brought to company A standards in those first 24 months. And I mean the numbers have to be redone in the first 12, uh, you know, circulated and, and, and updated and revised in the next six months, and then posted into the company's books in, the, in that final six to 12 months, uh, and because there is a 24-month time limit for purchase accounting, which means if you're going to take the value of the business you just acquired and say, okay, now that we bought this business, we're going to reassess all the things that are in this company's books because now it's ours. We couldn't do this before when we were negotiating to purchase it. Now that it's closed, we're going to revalue everything. And trust me, when a company, when a company acquires another, uh, the pension number gets revised uh, based on the new actuarial assumptions of the acquiring company. Uh, that's just a normal course of business that's gone on for decades. Uh, looking at the product warranty costs, saying, you know, we, we look at warranty costs going out 10 years, not 8 years, or something like that. That's normal. Environmental is also normal. It should be evaluated in that same way, too, to say, now that we're acquiring this, this business, uh, these sites that only have three years of spending forecast, we need to get them up to our company standard, the acquiring company standard of 10 years. So we need a 10-year forecast. Well, my point in this, this bullet point here on the slide is, if you're going to align reserve policies, you've got 24 months to get the numbers booked. Not 24 months to, to re-estimate the numbers, but 24 months to get them vetted and, and approved around an organization. And for any of you that work for a large company and you're getting 200 to 300 emails a day, you know that just scheduling, and reaching alignment, and actually agreeing on what number needs to get booked, that takes so that's, uh, again, a, a, another activity that we found is very highly value-added, but in turn, uh, done far too rarely. Um, so questions that can be asked at a site level, I just want to draw your attention down to uh, the la next to last bullet point. Are inflation and discount rate assumptions explicitly stated? I want to point this out because the inflation and discount rate assumptions that, are, that go into environmental risk calculations are different than the ones that EPA uses in feasibility studies. They're different uh, ones that uh, actually Excel allows you to use uh, because the math is done differently than the, than the default Excel calculations for calculating a present value, for example. So I just want to draw your attention to, to AST 410-30, GASB 49, and ASTM uh, E2137 because they all provide specific instructions about how to do the calculations and the weighting, and they're incredibly useful references to just look at, read, and understand and say, this is the documentation that each site needs. It's over and above just saying inflation at 3%, discount rate at 6%, and moving forward. This, these, these, uh, these portions of GAP provide a reference for why this work has to be done a certain way and ensure that the consistency is done across sites and across, uh, perhaps even across geographic uh, jurisdictions. So with that, we're approaching the end of our uh, uh, a lot of time here today, and I just want to say we're all caught up on questions. I don't see any questions sitting in the queue, uh, so feel free to drop me a note uh, uh, using the GoToWebinar control panel. Use the chat feature, drop me a note. Uh, questions, feel free to use uh, that feature as well, and uh, I'll answer these questions as best I can. Uh, but with that, let me just conclude with a couple of questions that business managers and auditors can ask at the site level. 
these get to be uh, this, these get to be on the tricky side because they do get into what are more legal issues about how a liability is documented. Next, uh, the, the first question that, that uh, a manager can ask is, is there a demand letter to pay a share of an original investigation or feasibility study on a multi-party site? Is there anything in writing? Uh, so just a, a filing of a lawsuit or even an email, an invitation to come to a PRP meeting is, uh, is, a, is an expression of that intent. The accumulation of data around that is your organization expecting, expected by others to be on the hook is one of those gradual, slow-moving decisions. Uh, but the point that I want to get to is that there's an accumulation of information. Documenting that accumulation of information, especially it's slow-moving over a series of years for a very large site with many, many PRPs. It's important to have a, a handle on the documentation uh, around that, uh, uh, around individual sites and where the correspondence was, uh, where the correspondence is at, who's in charge of the response, The next is a little trickier. Is the correct entity holding the uh, the appropriate environmental liabilities, and is that entity solvent? An auditor would tell you that it's not appropriate to have an insolvent entity holding open-ended, undocumented uh, environmental liabilities. It's not a way to have a component component corporation of a large corporation to have what are in effect insolvent or bankrupt subsidiaries uh, in your corporate family tree. So uh, identifying the correct entity holding the liabilities and ensuring that those uh, entities are solvent uh, is a, is a to-do activity for business managers. And that activity is, is uh, sometimes done well, and sometimes uh, is, a, is a blind spot. I don't have any statistics for you, but I do uh, have, it, have experience that, that sometimes it is tough to keep corporate formality straight. Uh, I run one company, and I know the paperwork for one company here in California is, uh, is no easy matter, but running uh, a dozen or more different entities around the world can be quite complex, let alone hundreds or, or more for an older organization. The next point is uh, regarding the portion of ASC that looks at environmental risks, whether it's guarantees or instruments of financial assurance. Are they referencing insolvent or non-operating businesses? And is the way that things were done a few years ago the way they should be done today? So that is a, a point of uh, Serving corporate formalities that is uh, generally accepted as more of a legal question, but is also, again, a business issue of looking at environmental risks, ensuring that the right entity is using the right type of money, that those entities all will pass an audit. Um, with that, let me move on to uh, one of our, our last couple slides here. I'll, I'll slip the ones about uh, recoveries. Uh, there are several uh, views about this, but I just want to get into fair value measurement for a moment um, and say that there are some very specific prescriptive obligations under ASC 820 that may affect your work. And one is to take a look at if your spending experience on completed projects is really applied to similar sites that you've got in the study or investigation stage. This is actually an, uh, an obligation under part of uh, ASC 410-30, 2515A, uh, to, to look at your comparable, uh, comparable projects, comparable weighting of scenarios, and use that data, not say that you know, every site is going to be so incredibly unique that we've got no comparable experience. Your organization probably knows plenty, uh, and through the internet could probably find quite a bit more. So it's important to apply that knowledge, uh, and ASC 410 does require that documentation. Uh, our cost metrics, like disposal cost per ton of soil, uh, dollars per gallon of brown water, uh, uh, compiled and tracked and so on. Part of ASC 410 is also a part of ASC 820 saying you've got a rational, historic basis for calculating future costs, and it's based on actual recent losses experienced by your company or someone just like you. So that obligation is, uh, is already out there to not say it's, it's not estimable today under ASC 450, but instead it's estimable based on historical experience, which we're deriving from ASC 410-30. The next po point that I just want to uh, say is a little bit out of left field, but we find it applies again and again, is remedy failure factored into the expected value of a site's cost forecast. This is a part of, uh, of ASC 410, uh, ASC 820, so it's part of GAP. It's also part of an ASTM standard E2137-06, which in, again says if you think that's one of the outcomes that's possible, is that this remedial technology will fail, stop just waiting the different solutions that you're going to. Think about it from a business perspective, from an audit perspective, 
do you have a guarantee this solution is going to fix the risk? And if you don't think it's going to fix the risk and remove the liability, you've got to step back and say, well, then what will plan B be? And factor that into uh, the forecast for what the environmental risk is going to cost to resolve, and in turn, what may be the reserve to put on the company's books today. Uh, finally, uh, the, is counterparty risk of default monitored and calculated on a systemic basis? We think uh, we think this is an, uh, an enormous blind spot. ASC 820 requires these calculations. ASC 410 requires the calculation. AST ME 2137 makes space for these calculations. We've been developing and providing tools, and we're still seeing that uh, the, the response we're getting is uh, from, from prospective users of this information. Corporate managers are saying auditors aren't asking for this, and auditors are saying corporate managers aren't preparing this. Uh, and so we're, we're caught into a little bit of a loop saying ERCI can do this. It's significant. It's a big risk. If you look at a portfolio of liabilities, you know, the, the General Motors and Chrysler bankruptcies impacting your cascading environmental liabilities. Any company in the Fortune 500 will have assertion now here, but, but a handful to dozens and dozens of examples of counterparty risk that can be tracked and be cost effectively mitigated because they really do accumulate uh, by default. They accumulate and grow. And I don't think anyone really does want to accumulate this type of risk going forward. Uh, with that, let me uh, uh, finalize our presentation here today with uh, just covering a little bit about what the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board does. And this was created uh, from scratch as part of Dodd-Frank, which was passed in 2010 after the last uh, uh, financial crisis really hit. It was the federal government's response, much as Sarbanes-Oxley was in 2002, to a series of, of unique, uh, unique events. And um, in turn, the PCAOB was created to help resolve or prevent uh, the type of uh, understood financial uh, consequences that happen. So some of the, the activities that came out of this affect how environmental liabilities are studied, how environmental liabilities are booked. Uh, so one of the questions that an auditor can ask today under AU 336.08 is the specialist providing a liability forecast qualified, even qualified, to produce a reliable estimate. So this puts an, an, an auditor, this gives the, an auditor the power today, and it's had that power for four years now. This gives an auditor the power to look at the resume of someone preparing an environmental reserve forecast or an environmental liability forecast and determine if they're qualified. And if they're not, by default, an auditor's got the power to overwrite the uh, existing environmental liability forecast and replace it with their own. The next bullet point, and I'll close with this one, 336.11 says, is a specialist's objectivity impaired? That is, is, it, is the, uh, the specialist preparing the estimate a current vendor or subject to working in the chain of command at an operating business? If, if uh, that is the case, an auditor is free to adjust the environmental risk forecast, cost forecast, unilaterally. Those are some pretty startling powers, and they've been in place for several years. I haven't seen them used egregiously. I haven't seen them used capriciously. But they, those are powers that are already in the hands of auditors. So again, like anything else you can look back on today, in 2014, we have plenty of rules. We have plenty, plenty of rules. We don't have even enforcement. We don't have even application of those rules. But there are plenty of rules already out there. So I just want to leave that with, uh, with you today, is that there are plenty of obligations and requirements to work with if you have uh, some interest in keeping in touch with, with us about this. Uh, we think we're going to be keeping at this for quite some time. If you want to learn more uh, about our products and services, our website, of course, is ERCI.com. We're a small firm. We don't update our website very often. Um, uh, what we try to do is through these uh, webinars is just inform what we're seeing in our experience and share that experience, and we hope you do the same. If we can uh, invite you to speak in one of our webinars or you would like me to speak in one of yours, uh, reach out. Let's discuss that. Uh, if you'd like to see a needs analysis of what we can do or hear our webinars on ERCI's YouTube channel, feel free. We don't ask for any registration information. We don't ask for any money. We just want to get our perspective out and hear what you think about our perspective. So again, feel free to drop me an email if you'd like to, uh, to get a link to that. If you need a copy of the presentation or uh, uh, citations of where to find uh, generally accepted accounting principles or would like to invite yourself or colleagues to our future ERCI webinars, please drop me. With that, I'm going to grab a, a coffee here for a second, stop the recording, and uh, uh, again, uh, 
stand by for any questions here for the next few minutes or so. Thanks again for joining us today on our webinar on uh, auditors and managers. What do you really need to know about environmental liabilities? Thanks again for joining us today.